In this lecture video, we're going to focus on the free energy change of a reaction, or delta G reaction. Delta G reaction is a direct criterion for determining the spontaneity of a reaction, and it is derived from the second law of thermodynamics, which is that the entropy change of the universe must be greater than zero. As a quick reminder, we can split the universe into its two components, a system, which in this case is the reaction, and its surrounding. And the entropy change in the surrounding is directly related to the enthalpy change of the reaction at a specific temperature, because this equality describes the heat transfer between the system or reaction and its surrounding. But by rewriting this, we can now define this new thermodynamic function, delta G, as being equal to delta H minus temperature times delta S. And what's really useful about this equation is that now everything is in terms of the system or the reaction. But now the condition for spontaneity is that the delta G of the reaction must be less than zero. And to be spontaneous then, for delta S universe, it was important for that change to be in the positive direction. But for delta G of the reaction, a spontaneous process, the sign of delta G of the reaction should be negative. When these values are equal to zero, that means no change occurs, and that means then that the reaction is at equilibrium. And if delta S of the universe is negative, or delta G of the reaction is positive. These are not favorable sign changes, and that means the reaction is not spontaneous. Now, do note that if you run a chemical reaction in the reverse direction, then the sign of these thermodynamic functions will flip. And so when a reaction is considered not spontaneous, for example, if the free energy change is positive, what that really means is that actually the reaction run in reverse would be spontaneous. There are several complementary ways to determine the delta G of a reaction. One of these ways is to use tabulated values of standard free energies of formations. And these are also found in Appendix B in your textbook. The standard free energy change of formation is similar to the enthalpy change of formation in that it is relative to its constituent elements. And so these elements in their standard state would have a zero for the delta G of formation. And as before, if you wanted to determine a change in a thermodynamic parameter of a reaction, you would have a sum where that thermodynamic parameter of the products are multiplied by their coefficients in the balanced chemical reaction. And then you would subtract that thermodynamic parameter of the reactants also multiplied by the coefficients of the balanced reaction. So this reaction here for the delta G of a reaction is essentially identical to that for the delta H of a reaction and also the delta S of a reaction. In this balanced chemical reaction where my reactants A and B are forming the products C and D, and these lowercase letters represent the balanced coefficients, I can write the delta G of the reaction as a sum of the delta G formation of the products multiplied by their coefficients and subtracting the delta G formation of the reactants also multiplied by their coefficients. A second way to find the delta G of a reaction is to go back to its definition where it's defined as delta H of a reaction minus the temperature times delta S of the reaction. Now, this equality is only true under the ideal conditions where the reaction occurs at constant pressure and temperature. In general chemistry, we do hold to these ideal conditions, and so this equation will always be valid in our class.
So coming to the variables in this equation, again, we have our three thermodynamic functions, delta G, delta H, and delta S. And one thing I'd like to know is that delta G and delta H have the same units of kilojoules per mole. One thing you have to be careful in using this equation is that delta S is reported in joules per mole per Kelvin. And so you'll want to do a conversion between joules and kilojoules in order to use this equation properly. And again, our last variable here is temperature, which is used in Kelvins. So we can use this equation to quantitatively determine delta G if we knew the delta H of the reaction, the temperature, and delta S. We can also determine delta G if we just know the heats of formations of the products and reactants and the standard molar entropies of those products and reactants. And then in a first step, we can first calculate delta H and delta S and then plug them into this equation to find the value for delta G. This equation is also useful for qualitatively assessing whether a reaction will be spontaneous or not by looking at what the sign is for the delta H of the reaction and also delta S of the reaction. So we want to be mindful of the subtraction sign and also the fact that temperature in kelvins will always be a positive number. So there are a few different scenarios that can occur and so we'll run through them one by one. In the first scenario, is the most favorable scenario. The reaction is exothermic, so delta H is negative, and the reaction increases in entropy, so delta S is positive. So we have a negative number subtracting a positive product, and that means then that the delta G sign will always be negative, no matter what the temperature is. And so under these favorable conditions, delta G will always be spontaneous. And so this is a green traffic light to indicate that this is always a go. In the next scenario, we're going to look at the polar opposite, where now both the enthalpy change and the entropy change are unfavorable. So delta H is endothermic or positive, and the entropy change is negative. And so we have a positive number subtracting a negative number. So these two minus will form another positive value. And that means then the delta G of this reaction will always be positive. And this is an indication that this reaction as written is not spontaneous. And represented here by this red traffic light. In these next two scenarios, the thermodynamic parameters delta H and delta S are mixed in that one is favored, but the other is not. And so in this first example, we can have an exothermic reaction, that's good, but then the entropy change is negative, which is not favored. Or we can have an entropy change that's positive, which is favored, but then an enthalpy change that's endothermic or disfavored. In these cases, delta G can actually have different signs of either being positive or negative, and that really depends on the value of the temperature. And so in these cases, then, it's a yellow light. It might be a green light depending on the temperature, but it could also be a red light. This equation of delta G is often represented in a graphical form where we have delta G along the y-axis and temperature along the x-axis. Oftentimes, the delta H and the delta S of a reaction do not vary significantly with temperature. And so it is a decent assumption that we can treat these values as constants with respect to temperature. And therefore, the delta H in such a reaction would represent the y-intercept value. And then minus delta S would represent the slope. So the plot of delta G versus temperature would be expected to be a straight line. So these plots are useful because when delta G is positive in this quadrant, 
these reactions are not spontaneous. But if delta G is negative, then these reactions are spontaneous. And since temperature is in kelvins, then we can only start at zero and move towards positive values. In the most favorable scenario, where delta H is negative and delta S is positive, we know that delta G sign can only be negative. So here's how that would look like in a linear plot. Our y-intercept, delta H, would have to be below zero to be negative. And then because we're subtracting delta S, which is a positive number, that means then the slope of this line is negative. And so we would proceed straight down where the slope of the line is equal to minus delta S. So we can see that at zero Kelvin, delta G is already spontaneous. But as we increase the temperature, delta G becomes increasingly negative. And so this is an example where under these favorable conditions of delta H and delta S, delta G can only be negative and spontaneous. In this next scenario, we consider the unfavorable conditions where the reaction is endothermic and the change in entropy is negative. And here we had discussed that the sign of delta G can only be positive. So in a linear plot, delta H would be our y-intercept and it's positive, so it would be above zero. And because the slope is equal to minus delta S, and if delta S is a negative number, that means the slope of this linear line will be positive overall. And so here's the line for delta G. And so you can see that already at low temperatures, or even zero Kelvin, the reaction is not spontaneous. But as we increase temperature, it becomes only less spontaneous. And so delta G will always be greater than zero under these conditions for delta H and delta S. In this next scenario, we're going to consider a mixed case where the delta H of the reaction is favorable, but the delta S of the reaction is not. And because of these two opposing forces, the delta G of the reaction may be spontaneous or not spontaneous as a function of what that temperature value is. So we can draw this as a linear line, and because delta H is negative, we start with a negative y-intercept. And because delta S is also negative, the slope of this line would be positive, since we have a minus and a minus here. And so we can see that the delta G of the reaction first begins negative, then traverses zero, and finally becomes positive as we increase temperature. That temperature where it traverses zero is called the crossover temperature, and it's formally that temperature when the delta G is equal to zero. So coming back to this top equation, if we plug in delta G equals zero for the crossover temperature, we can come out with a related equality that says the crossover temperature is just equal to delta H over delta S. In this plot, we can see that a low temperature below that of the crossover temperature, delta G does have a negative value, and therefore the reaction is spontaneous. However, above the crossover temperature, delta G becomes positive, and then the reaction is no longer spontaneous. One example of a reaction that fits this behavior is magnesium metal plus oxygen to form magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide has these strong magnesium oxygen bonds, and so it's very exothermic and stable to form this product. However, because oxygen is a gas and it's on the reactant side, entropy favors the left side of this reaction. So coming back to the delta G equals delta H minus T delta S equation, you'll see that temperature can really amplify the effect of 
entropy. But delta H is dominant at low temperature. So because this reaction is favored by delta H, it's at low temperature then that this reaction is spontaneous. But as we move to higher temperatures, critically above the crossover temperature, then the entropy of the reaction, which is not favored, wins over the enthalpy of the reaction. And delta G in this region is not spontaneous. On my last slide here, I'd like to cover the final scenario, which is a mixed case where the delta S of the reaction is positive and favored, but the delta H of the reaction is endothermic and disfavored. So the linear plot of delta G versus temperature would look like this, where delta H being positive would lead to a positive y-intercept that's above zero. And now because delta S is also positive, and this is minus delta S, then the slope of this line would be negative. And so you can see we traverse from a positive value for delta G through delta G equals zero, now to delta G being negative. And again, this crossover temperature is shown here with delta G equals zero. And that means below that crossover temperature, this reaction is not spontaneous because delta G is positive. However, now at higher temperature, above the crossover temperature, the reaction becomes spontaneous, where delta G is negative. And that's because at higher temperature, delta S is amplified. And here in this example, it's delta S that's favored and not delta H. An example of a chemical reaction that fits this behavior is the one shown here, where a molecule of N2O4 splits into two molecules of NO2. So here, enthalpy favors the reactant side, but entropy favors the product side because we have more moles of gas on the right side. So at low temperatures where enthalpy term is dominant in the delta G equation, then N2O4 is favored, and this reaction as written is not spontaneous. However, if we raise the temperature above the crossover temperature, now the entropy term can dominate. And because entropy favors the product side, this reaction does become spontaneous at higher temperatures.